Well, good morning. It is good to see you here. Let's stand together as we worship our Lord. Lord, we do thank you for the privilege of coming together today and to worship you. And Lord, we thank you that we can worship the King who is exalted, who is on high. And Lord, it still amazes me to think that the Lord of all creation stops to hear our praise, to hear my praise. And Lord, I thank you for the amazing love that that shows. And Lord, I just pray that you will help us to focus in on you today and to truly worship you in spirit and in truth. We ask this in your name. Amen. Um, I'm going to share just a couple of announcements, and I want to give you just a heads up. I'm going to ask if anyone wants to share a word of testimony after that. So if you want to share an announcement of what God has been doing in your life, that would be great. But um, next Sunday, we will be back to one service. Um, when that service will be, that is in part up to you. Um, the ballots for that are on the table back here in Jewel Hall. Please make sure that you vote once. Um, either on your way in or your way out. And if you didn't on your way in, it has to be on your way out now. I thought of that after I started saying that. But um, please make sure uh, you let us know which you would prefer to have the service at 10 or at 11. And then we'll be getting the word out as to which way the vote went um, this week. And if you do not hear, please look on the website or on the Facebook page. It will be posted there. And um, next week we will be having the one service and we will be having Sunday school again. So um, please uh, get, get those ballots in. We really appreciate that. Then also Thursday, Higher Ground starts. Um, it's going to be a different program this year. Um, it's going to be kind of a drive-through uh, parking lot, Higher Ground, and exactly how that is going to work, I don't know. And I've heard all the announcements on it and all the directions and talked with the leaders, and we're still not sure. But it's going to, and we would appreciate your prayers for that. And then on Saturday, starting at 9 o'clock, we're going to be having a work bee here at the church. 
Um, a big part of the, the jobs will be power washing the sides of the church. And um, if you can help with that, we'd appreciate that. And then we've also got a couple other jobs that we could use some workers on. So if you are able to come, um, please talk to Denny, if you would. Denny, if you, yep. Um, double check with him and he can give you all the details. Anyone want to share? Um, I'm here on behalf of the stewards to say thank you for donating to Life Resources. We have uh, had a really successful donations this time. We've collected 971 diapers, 108,000, or 1,800, sorry, diaper wipes, two tubs of formula, four receiving blankets, a, a play yard, and a walker. And also, we had $574 in cash donations, so thank you so much. It's very appreciated. All right. Anyone else want to just share a quick word of testimony of what God has been doing? Let's stand together as we continue to worship our Lord.
That is a beautiful song. And the thought of Jesus, oh Jesus, come and fill your lambs. That is good. And it's good for us to sing that. It's good for us to think that. But it's also quite easy for us to sing that. Because we're just saying, you know, Lord, fill this place. But our experience with Jesus needs to be a personal one. And so I'd like us to sing that chorus again. But instead of just singing, come and fill your lambs, what I want us to sing is, come and fill me. And we have to stick an extra little pause in there because the, the wording doesn't fit. But the thought sure does. And as we sing it, I, I pray that you will make it a prayer. Jesus, oh Jesus, come and fill me. prayer today that you will come and that you will fill us. Lord, I pray that you will help us to be open to your spirit. Lord, scripture makes it clear your your spirit wants to talk to us. Your spirit does communicate with us, but we need to be open to that. And so, Lord, I just pray that today you will help us to be open to your spirit. Lord, that we will accept the word that you have for us and that you will indeed come and fill me. And Lord, that can be a scary thought. Lord, if we give you all, what what will you want? What will have to change? But Lord, it's, it's where we find the joy. It's where we find the strength. It's where we find the victory is when we surrender fully to you. So Lord, we do surrender our lives to you. Lord, I pray that you will come and fill me, that you will fill each of us here today. Lord, we do lift up many who are hurting. Lord, we, we especially lift up uh, Joyce Tripp today as she's back in Butterworth and going to be having a test in the near future. Lord, I just pray that you will be with her, that things will go well. Lord, we just pray that you will touch her body, that you will give her strength. And I pray for her and Rob both, that you will help them to be a witness to the, the medical staff around them of the difference that your love makes in our lives. And Lord, again, I just pray that you will come and fill us today. We ask this in your name. Amen.
seated. Um, on Wednesday, we did the delivery for the kids, uh, for Kids Jam and for the youth. We, uh, we took out the stuff. There were, there were a few glitches in the delivery system, but um, overall it went pretty well, and so I want to thank you for your prayers on that. And I would also very much appreciate if you would continue to pray for us. Uh, coming up on the 21st, we're going to be making the decision on how we're going to minister for the rest of the fall semester. So um, we really would appreciate your prayers. But we started out at 6 o'clock, and the delivery itself went well. But I had some problems getting to the delivery. Um, Wednesday afternoon at 3.30, I had an appointment, a, a meeting up in Manton. And it was a conference meeting. It was supposed to last one hour. So 3.30 to 4.30, you'd make it just fine. Um, if you've ever been to church BOA meetings or you know, conference BOA meetings or probably any other type of organizational meeting, you know that quite often they have a tendency to start late and run long. So at 5.01, I finally stood up and said, I'm, I'm sorry, I have to go. I'm driving the van at 6. Come to find out I didn't drive the van, but I thought I was. And so I had an, less than an hour to make it from Manton to here and be ready to go at 6. Um, we usually figure 45 minutes from Manton if everything is perfect. You know, no traffic holdups, weather is perfect, everything's just fine. Um, and we knew they were doing the work on 115, didn't know what they had. So I was a little concerned and trying to make good time on the roads, you know? And I got down the freeway as quick as I could, got off onto 115 and headed east on, you know, 115. And if you're familiar with the road, just a, a little ways uh, this side of Cadillac, they have the first passing lane. You go up over that little hill and, and there's the lake off on the south and it's so pretty and quite often the lake is calm and it's just gorgeous. And I love looking at that lake. I never saw the lake on Wednesday. Because as I came over the hill, what caught my eye was the police officer sitting over on the left side running radar at my lane. Now, in that condition, do you think I was happy to see a police officer? <laughs> no, I wasn't. Um, I will jump ahead in the story. I did not get a ticket. Um, I was over the limit, but well below the cushion. Um, and actually, the guy in front of me was slowly pulling away anyway, and the officer never looked at either one of us. Um, so I was okay. But if you're not actually obeying the law, um, when you see an enforcer of the law, when you get a reminder of the law, when you see the law, it doesn't make you feel too good. There's usually a quick feeling of guilt, and then, in the, especially in a situation like that, um, the fear that you are going to receive your just desserts. And I wanted much more grace than justice at that time, you know? And, but if you're obeying the law, then it's no problem. There have been many times I've been very happy to see police officers. You know, what, when I've been in trouble or something like that, or when, um, you know, they come to help, they're, they're, they are there to protect you. When you're doing what you should, the law is fine. And you're glad to, to know the law is there. You're, it, it, it encourages you, it protects you, it strengthens you. But when you're not doing what you should, the law tends to give guilt. We've been looking in the book of Nehemiah, and the Israelites have been struggling uh, to rebuild the walls of Jerusalem. And I've got good news. In Nehemiah chapter 6, verse 15, Nehemiah reports that they rebuilt the walls. The walls were completed in 52 days. And I know we've been talking about the walls for quite a while. There's some good material in there, so I know I, I've gone slow through this, these, uh, few verse, or these few chapters. And... I've gone slow enough that it actually took us longer to talk about their rebuilding the wall than it actually took them to rebuild the wall. Um, but there's good stuff in there, you know? Um, and they got the walls rebuilt. Yay! And they did have a big celebration, and we'll probably get back to that next week. But what really struck me was what they did just after they completed the walls. About two weeks later, they had a Thanksgiving service in Jerusalem. And their Thanksgiving service was actually Thanksgiving service. Uh, that, when we do Thanksgiving, what we tend to do is say, Dear Lord, thank you for the turkey and mashed potatoes, you know? And we focus on 
football or deer hunting or getting ready for Black Friday, you know, or something like that. And once we get past the meal, it's like, oh, this is Thanksgiving? Okay. We don't give a whole lot of thanks usually. But when they did their Thanksgiving service, they were actually thanking God for what he had done. They actually wanted to praise, they wanted to worship, they wanted to learn about the Lord. And so, as or Nehemiah chapter 7, it tells us that Ezra the priest brought the law of Moses before the assembly. And check out the people's response. As he opened the book, the people all stood up. Ezra praised the Lord, the great God, and all the people lifted their hands and they responded, Amen and Amen. And they bowed down and they worshiped the Lord with their faces to the ground. These people wanted to worship God. They wanted to learn more about God. This was a time of celebration from them, for them. They were about to learn about God. They wanted to serve him, but realistically, a lot of them didn't know much about how to serve him. It's hard for us to imagine, but this is long before a printing press ever became available. So books were not available to most people. Everything that was, to, was written had to be written out by hand. So books were extremely expensive and they were extremely rare and the vast majority of people couldn't read anyway. And so, you know, for us, we all have Bibles, you know. Mo most of us have multiple Bibles. And just in case if you don't, please let me know. We have a bunch in the office that we would be glad to share. Um, you know, we have them. We have God's Word. We can open it any time. They couldn't. For many of them, this would have been one of the few times that they actually heard God's word shared and explained to, uh, with them. And so they were excited about hearing this. And they were ready to worship. And uh, verse 8 tells us they read from the law of God, making it clear and giving the meaning so that the people could understand what was being read. So this was just what these guys wanted. They wanted to learn about the Word of God, and they started it with celebration. I mean, Ezra stood up, basically said, in the redneck version, I'm commencing to read now. And they all went, hallelujah! And, you know, it was just like an old-fashioned church service, you know, and, and people were starting to shout, and Brother Eubanks was running up and down the center aisle. Um, you had to go to Lake City back in the 1970s for that one. But um, it, he was getting blessed, and it was a good service. And, people, and so as they started to read, you would think the, that just kept going and kept building, and the people were back there going, preach it, get it, you know, go get them, preacher, right? No, not even close. The very next verse says, Nehemiah and Ezra said to the people, this day is sacred to the Lord your God. Don't mourn or weep, for all the people had been weeping as they listened to the words of the law. Why? This is exactly what they wanted to hear. They wanted to hear God's word to them. And yet when they heard it, they were weeping. The only reason I can think of it, it does not look from the context that it was tears of joy. These were tears of sadness. I think they realized how much they had messed up and how little they had actually been doing God's will. When they actually learned what the law was, they went, oh, man, we messed up. And they felt the guilt. They felt the conviction. They felt the sadness because they knew they had failed God, and they started to weep. You know, and that, that's actually a good thing. When we realize that we have failed someone, when we realize that we have hurt someone, that should bother us. It should make us sad. You know, it, I was looking on uh, Yahoo News this week, and they had a, a report on there about a tennis player. I can't remember the name of the, the player or anything. I'm assuming it's in the big match that they had, but... Um, the headline was how this tennis player hit an official with a ball and was heavily penalized for it and all that sort of thing. And, you know, the, the, the player had a, t a tantrum on the court and hurt an official, you know, and I'm thinking, oh, man, what a jerk. And then they showed the video, and they showed right in on the guy's face. And what happened? He got frustrated playing, and I, I don't know 
what caused it, but he was frustrated, and he just kind of went, bam, and smashed the ball that way. And he didn't look where he smashed it. And he proceeded to hit uh, one of the officials in the throat with the ball. Now, she was okay, but she didn't know that right away. And so there was some coughing and gagging and wheezing and, you know, that sort of thing, and everybody gathered around, you okay, you okay? And she, ah, you know, and, but what struck me was the guy's face. You could see it, you know, it, he was just frustrated, what, bam. And then the way his face changed when he saw what was happening. His eyes got as big as saucers, you know, and he kind of, and he even got his hand out there trying to stop the ball, you know, no, it, way too late once you hit it, you know, but he was trying. As soon as he realized what he had done, there was instant sorrow, there was instant regret, there was instant guilt, you know, he didn't want to do that. He felt bad about it. And we should, you know, if we hurt somebody, we're supposed to feel bad about that. When we go against God's will, when we hurt God, that should hurt us too. And God actually helps us with that. John chapter 16, verse 8, Jesus tells us that when he returns to the Father, that the Holy Spirit would be coming into the world and that one of the Spirit's primary roles would be to convict the world of guilt in regard to sin. Now, feeling convicted, feeling guilty about something, that, that is no fun. That, that's, not, that's not something we want to experience. But it is good for us because unless we feel the, the guilt, unless we feel the sadness, unless there's some remorse, then there's not likely to be a change of behavior. I mean, and that's why the Spirit speaks to us, so that we, He can point us in a better direction. I mean, it's just like a parent when you're trying to train a child. I mean, kids do not naturally come into the world being kind and considerate for other children. And a lot of kids really struggle with that concept that it's not okay to take some, you know, the other kid's toy. And a lot of kids, they don't have a problem with making the other kid cry. You know, they, that just doesn't bother them. And so it's the parent's job to teach them a better way. And that's what the Spirit does. The Spirit comes to try to teach us a better way. And so basically the Spirit speaks into our lives and says, man, that's not what you're supposed to be doing. And we feel the conviction, and we feel the guilt, and the sadness. The Spirit doesn't speak into us just to make us sad. The Spirit speaks into us to show us the better way, and the better way, that's following God's will for us. That's where we find the joy. The people, uh, Ezra and Nehemiah told them to stop grieving then it says, because the joy of the Lord is your strength. And then all the people went away to celebrate with great joy because they now understood the words that had been made known to them. They not only understood the words of the law, I think they chose to apply them. There's quite a bit that's glossed over in just this very brief report. Um, this very brief report of a couple verses covers several hours. And I think the people not only felt conviction for their sin, I think they chose to change their behavior. And it was after they, they asked God to forgive them and they changed their behavior that Ezra and Nehemiah said, don't grieve. You don't have to grieve anymore. The Lord wants to give you joy. And I believe that because the next two chapters, the Israelites come back together and they have a full chapter confession that they all agree to. And they have a, a written covenant that they uh, write up that they are going to follow God's commandments and they sign their names to that. So I think what happened here is the Spirit convicted them of their sin. They confessed that sin, they asked God to forgive them, and they decided to follow God's will. And that's how they found the joy. You know, and that makes a pretty good pattern for us too. They thought they were doing okay. And we usually figure we're doing okay. But when God shows us something, we need to make the choice of how we're going to respond. Will we confess our sins, ask him to forgive us, and then change our behavior? Or will, will we just basically choose to live with the guilt? 
You know, and when the Spirit speaks to us, we know. I mean, sometimes people speak to us and try to speak guilt into our lives. And that doesn't work nearly as well. And that's a good thing. But if there's no conviction with the admonition, you know, it, I, it, when I was a high school senior, uh, some friends and I uh, hopped on our motorcycles during lunch break and ran down to A&W for lunch. Um, and we got back to school a few minutes later than what we were supposed to be. Um, A&W was a lot better than the cafeteria, but it was also slower, you know. Um, and so we got back a few minutes late, and we're walking up to the building. And who should meet us just outside the door but the high school principal and the superintendent. It was just a bonus day, you know. Um, and the superintendent, or I mean the principal, let us know that we were late for class. And we said, yeah, we know, we're sorry about that. And we were genuinely sorry about being late for class. Not so much that, you know, we would miss part of class, but if you have any type of shy streak when you're in high school, you don't want to draw attention to yourself by marching into a class late and having everybody look. So we were genuinely sorry that we were late for class. Then he went on and he said, well, and besides, you know this is a closed campus. You're not supposed to be leaving during the school day. I was not trying to be a jerk. I wasn't. But I had never heard that before. <laughs> I didn't normally drive to school. Um, I didn't need to know these rules, you know. I didn't normally have any transportation. I'd never heard that. They never enforced it or anything, so we just ran out for lunch. We come back, and it's closed campus. And the first thing that came out of my mouth was, really? I had no idea. And we walked on in. <laughs> um, I'm very fortunate that he did show us grace and not just desserts at that point, you know. Um, but he was trying to teach us. And he was trying to bring conviction for our behavior, and he was hoping that we would change our behavior. He was not the Holy Spirit. <laughs> um, there was no guilt that we felt. <laughs> um, we did not ask forgiveness, nor did we change our behavior. Um, they didn't enforce the rule anyway, you know, so I have it. Um, if there's no conviction with the admonition, it doesn't mean much. That's why, you know, in, in church or any place else, we could list a whole lot of things that we're supposed to avoid, you know, and that sort of thing. But unless the Spirit speaks into our lives, it doesn't mean much. But if the Spirit is speaking into your life today, if He's showing you something that needs to change, you have a choice. You can choose as the people here did to repent of their sins, to ask God to forgive them of their sins, and to change their behavior to follow God's laws. And then find the joy that they found in serving Him. Or you can choose to live with the guilt. I would encourage you to choose joy. That's the way God wants us to live. Let's stand together for prayer. Dear Lord, I do thank you for the way that you do continue to speak into our lives, to show us your will, to show us your truth. Lord, I pray that you will help us to be open to your Spirit's leading, that we can learn the truth that you have for us, that we can apply it to our lives. And Lord, help us to be truly the people that you want us to be. We ask this in your name. Amen.